Howdy. Welcome to Osgrave Royalty. I am Justin. So, kind of another random uh, rant video. Not, not as self-indulgent as some of the others have been this season, <laughs> uh, for better or worse. Um, slightly more serious, this topic is Yoda speak. Um, yeah, uh, we're, we'll be talking about attachment theory. I want to keep this conversational. This is just my experience, uh, like discovering it, what it is, why I think it's really valuable and, and all that. It's something I considered actually doing like a robust study of, and I mean, it's still on my radar. So let me know if you want to know more about it. Although, I probably won't, to be honest, unless y'all really want me to. But uh, Thais Gibson from the Personal Development School, who I've mentioned, who I mentioned about every other video, uh, she does such a thorough and well done job of it. There's nothing I really can add, and she's got credentials and all that. So, I, I you know, uh, really valuable stuff over there. So go check that. I'll I'll link it below. Um, have some notes in front of me. I don't recall the exact moment I came across attachment theory. And, but I do remember that how shocked I was when I found it because being in philosophy and a lover of ideas of all kinds, somehow I had never heard of this whole segment of psychology of like, Secure attachment style, anxious attachment style, all that stuff. I'd never heard of it. Um, then I don't, I don't remember how I came across it. I think it was like something came up in my YouTube feed. And one of those rare occasions I branched out and glad I did. Um, but yeah, I found Thais Gibson and learned a lot about attachment theory and man, it, man, is it a revelation? Um, so archetypal psychology is one method you can use for self-knowledge, for self-examination, but attachment theory is another. And I think both are fruitful approaches. Um, and look, you know, it's your life. Uh, you have nuanced problems use whatever damn tool you want to use, you know, whether it be archetypal psychology, even working harder, just banging your head against the wall, just to rattle the problem around, shake it loose so you can, what, whatever works. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not married to any sort of theory, archetypal psychology or other. I think archetypal is a underexplored and valuable idea. That's why I, I like it. Um, well, among many other reasons, but, but yeah, uh, sometimes it's not, there's, there are problems that occur that it just, one tool can't do everything, you know? So use all the tools in your toolbox to live the best life you can. And yeah, um, yeah, it, it, attachment theory, learning about it has been a revelation, um, I don't remember whether I discovered attachment theory before narcissistic theory. Um, I think it was prior. Um, but I sort of discovered them simultaneously. Uh, like narcissism has a distinct style where there's intense intimacy or f like quasi faux intimacy, F O U X. Sorry, F-A-U-X, my bad. Um, like, a lot of intimacy up front called the love bombing. For men, this can be, uh, like, sex up front. For women, it can be promises of trips and stuff like that. Um, then a devaluing, where they insult you out of the blue, and then they discard you. They move on. Uh, they've taken what they've needed, what's known as narcissistic supply, and then you're out. <laughs> uh, sadly, that did happen to me. Um, 
and it really sucked. And I was wondering because like it was a unique experience for me because I'm pretty well put together. I don't really like have really low lows, but this one really bothered me. And for the first time I, I was angry, like, uh, I couldn't identify a why it wasn't at the person and it wasn't at myself. It was, I don't know. It was, that's the thing about when you go through an interaction with a narcissist, at least this is my amateur opinion. Look, you know, people say narcissism, they throw that word around like an insult. I don't mean it as an insult. I mean it just as a fact it's, it's the mo it made the most sense as to the pattern at what happened. I was, there was, you know, a lot of, in, there was intense intimacy up front. There was then followed by insulting. And then there was a discarding. So it fit the pattern perfect, fit the pattern perfectly. And that guy I've looked, you know, I've tried to process like, did I make, did, what did I do? You know, what did they do? Was it this, that, you know, I, I had time to, self-examine and it's not really in my nature to hold grudges or anything like that. Um, I've had breakups before they've all went pretty well as good as they can be. There's no, like no king of a car or crazy stuff like that. Uh, thank God. But this one, this one was, uh, annoying. It gnawed at me. I was trying to, it took me a long time to figure out what the hell had even happened to me. Um, and it was in that search that I came to attachment theory and like the narcissistic cycle. Um, so we talked about attachment theory in the last season when we talked about the book archetypes by Dr. Anthony Stevens, I'm calling it season one, go check that out. <laughs> if you haven't already, a lot of good material there. Um, so back to attachment theory, um, Thais, goes by like there are f she articulates four attachment styles there's the secure attachment style the anxious avoidant the fearful avoidant and the dismissive avoidant and just like ev everything these attachment styles are <laughs> based and formed in our childhood i'm going to go through them briefly here but check out her channel for the the details so the secure attachment develops when there's a consistent and predictable foundation of love and support. The child feels that their surroundings are stable and secure and the caregivers are reliable. The anxious attachment style develops when there's a fear of abandonment instilled in the child. The result is that the child feels fundamentally inadequate and rejected. Typically, this is caused by neglect or inconsistent support from parents. This will cause people with this style to a people please as a preemptive defense for being abandoned. They think that if a connection can be solidified with the other person, that they won't leave them. The fearful attachment style develops when the child feels unsafe or taken advantage of. Tragically, it can develop in children that have been abused. They become cynical early, constantly looking for any sign that they're about to be betrayed. In relationships, they can act aloof and erratic, one moment being fine and the next moment pulling away. Finally, the dismissive attachment style arises when the child learns that no one is going to help them. As a result, they become hyper-independent and keep others at a distance. Anytime people try to connect or get close, they begin to get anxious because they feel that people can't be relied upon. They both want to connect, but feel unsafe when they do. Uh, one interesting note about the dismissive avoidant is that people with this attachment style are going to be what you most likely find on dating apps or to be single because they have trouble maintaining closeness with people. Uh, I personally find that very interesting and it makes a lot of sense based on the advice that the manosphere, manosphere sometimes gives, such as don't text too, don't text back too quickly. You know, if you're a high value male, that means you're busy and you ain't got time to text her back. So, and never double text and don't act needy and all that. Um, these are all red flags for dismissive avoidant people, people who are wary of intimacy. Uh, so you don't want to be conditioned 
with this advice to train yourself out of having intimate relationships because I have those with my friends in a healthy way and I have great friends and a great uh, relationship with my family. So uh, just consider the source <laughs> as with everything, as with what you're hearing right now. Um, yeah, so the Personal Development School has an online test which you can take uh, which will show you an estimate of where you land in like these areas. So I took it and I got 70% secure, 10% fearful, 20% anxious, and 0% dismissive. So I got a C. <laughs> I pass. I just have a little bit of trauma. Um, some unpredictability and some wanting to connect as a defense for being, to protect myself from being abandoned. Like, I like to see, I, I like to keep the people that I invest in emotionally um, because it's like a, it's like that a uh, fallacy of sunk costs, you know, like we had this great thing and why I don't like the, the idea of it going away <laughs> because we're bond, we, we bonded. Why, why break a health, why break a, a good thing? Why break what's not broken, you know, uh, so yeah, I I see a little bit of that self in me. I don't of course it's an online test. I don't know how you know hardcore Thais stands behind it. These are probably just general trends and you know what is it about what are the particulars? Like why 10% fearful not 20%? Um I've just got yeah, so I don't know the details like under the under the hood. It, it was a series of like self like answering questions. Um, again, yeah, I don't know how detailed that is, but yeah, I mean, 90% of the time I'm pretty stable. Um, but in my childhood and adolescence, I did have a lot of trouble with boundaries. I would have some friends that would like ask me for rides a lot. And I would say, yeah, because that's what friends do. That friends help friends, right? But then it took me years to realize, wait a minute, this is only one direction. <laughs> I'm the helper, you know? Uh, so I had some boundary issues there, but I think I mostly processed them. Um, of course, I'm not perfect. Um, but my big thing is what I've noticed throughout my life is once I call somebody a friend or a lover or whatever, then I, that it puts them in kind of an, like they have an immunity idol, like on survivor and I trust them. Right. I, I'm, I naively trust them. I'm like, they cannot do any harm to me. And now that I've assigned them that label, I am going to be there for them because I want to be a good friend and I have tunnel vision. So I, I, I ignore all kinds of things and I just am like, I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good friend and I can get lost in that, you know? So I think that's, that reflects in somewhat in that 20%. What else? I'm, I would say I'm a naive person as well. Um, somewhat like I, you know, it's funny I, I'm interested in all these things, and yet, um, whenever I share some idea, like whenever I learn about an idea, my first thought for some reason is, oh, everyone knew this already? Like, I somehow think, like, I know it's irrational, but I learned about something, and I figure, oh, everyone knows about archetypal psychology. Like, this information has been out here since Carl Jung and I'm just now discovering it. I'm, I always feel like late to the party. Like everyone already knew what I'm learning, you know? Um, it makes no sense, but, um, and Robert Bly talked about the naive male, uh, which is like, they assume that they, that everyone else thinks the way that you do. Um, like, of course, everyone wants intimacy in their relationships and nobody's dismissive, avoidant and wouldn't want to connect, you know? Um, like, I, I don't, 
I can only speculate as to where that comes from. I think one too many times I was humiliated and someone was like in a group and people looked at me like, oh, you didn't know that? You didn't know that? Um, and I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And they're like, wow, he didn't know that. And so I'm like paranoid. I may have like, uh, I think Freud calls it a reaction formation where like the the pendulum swung all the way in the other direction. And now I'm like, I, I learn about all these crazy things and I assume everyone already knows that. So I feel like I'm constantly catching up, you know, and then everyone already is an expert. In it. And it doesn't help that, you know, in our culture, there's a lot of posturing and a lot of uh, like self-marketing and building yourself up and stuff. So people can seem larger than life on social media and uh, people have outsourced a lot of their not their uh, their sources of knowledge to like other people, um, like a small minority of influencers or whatever. So yeah, I figure just you know everyone, I'm constantly playing catch up, and then you know all throughout my life I've talked to people and they're like, oh that's crazy, I've never heard about that, and I'm like, oh, so I've noticed like now I think I'm like way ahead in terms of like at least the width and the breadth of like what I've been exposed to. What I think I like now, but it's conscious now. Um, it's not like I've, I've processed that this about myself, but what I think I like now is specialty or, or specialization. So like I'll try and connect with people on their level. That's just empathy one-on-one. And when I talk to them, I'm constantly talking to people who are amazing at one thing. So I kind of put myself, since I'm more spread thin than focused, I tend to lack the uh, quality of knowledge that the people around me typically do because they're specialized. But I can look at things from different angles, but often people who are specialized don't really care about the other angles because they're specialized. And so my contribution to what they're saying seems very inferior compared to where they're at. And I'm, I feel like I'm perpetually in like a, a lower, uh, higher, lower in the dominance hierarchy or something because I'm, I'm humble. I want to learn, you know, and they say like, Hey, always be the dumbest person in the room so you can learn. And all my friends are better at me, better than me in some category but I'm just kind of like this glue monster that's kind of okay and interested in everything. And I think a lot of my friends like look like metaphor in my mind, this is a narrative I've constructed uh, that if they were like to sit down at the same table, they would be like confused. Like I don't care about it, any of this except my own goings on, you know, I'm like it's a, it's a pro and a con. So I'm this weird conduit that like, and it, it may come from also like my inner instinct to keep the peace. And I'm a great diplomat. Um, I a lot of my a lot of the people that I know are very extreme personalities in some way, and I love that. That's I, I love that. But I think I'm more again more of like just all. Basically, like I'm, yeah, I, basically, yeah, I'm just spread very thin and I'm, I connect with, uh, like my network is filled with people who are very specialized, um, for better or worse. I, I like it. Um, I like people who stand for something and like have, uh, I admire their expertise and, and all that. And again, I like learning from them and hope. I can contribute and with the friends that I have, I feel value valued and, and all of that. Um, you know, contrary, I'm contrary to what I just said about that. Like I'm talk, I'm kind of mixing and mashing, um, mixing and matching like throughout my childhood and life, what, what I, the people I've been around, like the specialists, but my real, my friendships now are great. They feel like it feels like a two way street and that's all I care about. Um, some, yeah, some friends like are extremely intelligent, but I make them laugh. So they, 
So there's value, you know, both ways. And that's just one example, you know? Um, so that was a rant. Oh, let's see, checking my notes again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone's kind of traumatized in some way. Uh, I don't know what a 100% secure person would look like, although I have met a, one of my friends, Eduardo. Uh, shout out to Eduardo if you're listening. Uh, we... We were closer friends. We were never very close, but pretty close friends about 15, 10 years ago. And he's probably the most mature person I've ever met. Um, he, I guess he was raised right, but I always really admired him. And I, I felt like, wow, he, I really looked up to him. Like his, He had a way about him. It's hard to explain, but some kind of uh, like poise. And I, I always like in, uh, envied that slash wanted to in, like saw that and was grateful that I had an example of what a really, really legitimately cool person is like. Not to say that, you know, all my friends are immature or anything. He was he was just like a cut above even like of anyone I've met, not just my friends. Um, yeah, we're all we're all somewhere on that scale. Um, so yeah, I have in my notes here. Um, I'll also say that I can't sustain any relationship that has no depth. It's exhausting. Uh, Robin Williams said that loneliness isn't being alone. It's being around people you don't connect with. And that nails it for me. Uh, if I don't feel connected, I start mentally wanting to escape and check out. And I, my, my tell is that I start yawning. I, I literally feel like the energy being sucked out of me uh, if I'm like not connecting with anybody. Typically, this happens like former, like once in a while, uh, like from previous jobs in the past. People have invited me to like bars where the music volume is like ten out of ten, and it's blowing out everyone's eardrums. It's like, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, wow, this is great to get to know each other, you know. Um, and everyone's kind of looking at each other like, well, this is incredibly awkward. Nobody can talk to each other. And I don't drink alcohol. So uh, I guess we're, it's like a masochistic, some kind of kinky thing where we look, where people look at each other and they're losing their hearing slowly. Uh, that's, that's, that's exciting. <laughs> um, so I also recognize within myself the we talked about the shadow warrior on this channel. Sounds cool, but it's actually psychologically unhealthy. Check that video out. But uh, of sadomasochism. So um like I I I'm compelled to be completely open and honest with people and I rarely hold anything back cuz I I'm I'm just a genuine authentic person. Um and I'm diplomatic. I like Yes, you go first, you know. Oh, it's all about you. How, wh how's your life going? You know, I'm a giver. And uh, C.S. Joseph, he has a YouTube channel um, about the Myers-Briggs stuff. I mean, he goes into way more depth about it. And to be honest, I, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a fan of the channel. It's just a channel I've watched a few videos on. Um, I actually took the test they offer, uh, he offers, and... I got ENFJ, um, which is basically a person who, when right when somebody else there, right when somebody else enters the room, all your personal needs go away, and it's all about them. They're tri ENFJs are tribe first um, people, um, and so they can struggle with their own identity because if they don't have a tribe. Like they they mold their identity to what the tribe needs, there and they can be great helpers, but they often get they often uh, have a lot of resentment because they start feeling taken for granted because they're giving too much. Again, back to my example about driving friends around back in the day. Um, like I assume that when I need the person, like they're going to give as much as I do, but other personality types don't share that sentiment. So that's something that I've had to learn. Um, but he came up with the term, uh, CS Joseph, uh, a shadow con or a covert contract. Covert contract is like an assumption you make that you don't, 
you're not conscious of, or maybe you are, but probably not. Uh, honestly, you're probably not conscious of it. And you, when they break that shadow contract, you feel slighted. And again, for the ENFJ, it's like, wait, I just helped. I just did all this. Like I let you talk for like an hour about your thing. And now when I talk, you're not making eye contact and you're checking your phone and stuff. Like the contract was like 50, 50, it's a two way street, but I didn't come out and like, I didn't come out and say that, but I just assumed like, yeah, we pay attention to one another when we're talking. But it, again, like other people don't think that's significant. <laughs> that's called a covert contract. It's a contract I've already, that I assume you've signed, which is disrespectful that you're going to listen to me when I listen to you. And that's not the case. Um, so that's the kind of sadomasochistic pattern that I, I notice that um, Robert Moore put it eloquently that sadom like masochists walk around with a wound that perfectly fits a sadist sword, right? Which is a great way to put it. Like I, I put myself out there. I make myself completely vulnerable and I almost want them to strike so that I know it's an easy way for me to know, oh, this is a shitty person, or I'm not going to get along with this person because um, if they're not matching that, then, you know, it makes it easy for me. And I'm built like a tank emotionally. Like I can take a lot of abuse and that's not a good thing. I know. Um, it's because in my past I've failed to set boundaries and I've taken way more abuse than I needed to. So I, in a way that's a blessing because I've developed a really thick skin of course, I'm not perfect. I, you know, I get upset. I get depressed, you know, just like anybody else. But I'm a lot better now emotionally, I would say. I've come a long way. Um, yeah, I think I have in my notes here, I think as a child, I was told to share my toy one too many times, you know? Like you're playing with a toy and all the other pe children around you, like in daycare, they want that toy. And now you're like looking and they're, they're ready to pounce and some of them will cry, create drama or scowl or whatever. And then Justin, you got to share your toy. Sharing's important. Oh, okay. I want to be a good boy. So I'm going to share. And then I give my toy away and I'm like, okay, any moment now, because the authority figure just told me that I needed to share and that sharing was a good thing and everyone around me heard it. So I'll just wait to be shared with. Okay. All right, waiting to be shared with because I was just told by the authority that sharing was good. So any moment now, somebody's going to say, hey, Justin, I, I really wanted to play with this toy, but sharing is a good thing. So here's my toy because I'm such a generous person. No, no, no. <laughs> that never happened. It, it was always like, uh, Stefan Molyneux calls it the least common denominator, lowest common denominator. Like the child that, creates the most fuss uh, is going to be catered to. And everyone has to cater to them because if you don't, they're going to ruin everything for everybody. So they, and then you, you know, my, my own theory is that this actually exists in society. Like, um, you know, you, we have to cater to the most handicapped in whatever way, the most disenfranchised individual. Otherwise, you know, we're uh, being cruel and cold and unempathetic. So the person with the least patience wins. <laughs> Good for narcissists. Um, yeah. Uh, last thing before we close out. Thanks for your patience here with my, all my ranting. But uh, I, I looked, True Detective Season 1 is the best TV series of all time, in my opinion. And uh, Matthew McConaughey's Rustin Cole, he said... People without a conscience usually do have a good time. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's so true. Reminds me of like that experience that I went through that got me into attachment theory and the narcissism and studying and all that. Anyway, um, hope you all will take the time to explore that domain. Let me know your thoughts below. Um, looking forward to this conversation um, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.